book one section fourteen of on duties by cicero translated by walter miller this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by geoffrey edwards section fourteen next in order as outlined above let us speak of kindness and generosity nothing appeals more to the best in human nature than this but it calls for the exercise of caution in many particulars we must in the first place see to it that our act of kindness shall not prove an injury either to the object of our beneficence or to others in the second place that it shall not be beyond our means and finally that it shall be proportioned to the worthiness of the recipient for this is the cornerstone of justice and by the standard of justice all acts of kindness must be measured for those who confer a harmful favour upon some one whom they seemingly wish to help are to be accounted not generous benefactors but dangerous sycophants and likewise those who injure one man in order to be generous to another are guilty of the same injustice as if they diverted to their own accounts the property of their neighbours now there are many and especially those who are ambitious for eminence and glory who rob one to enrich another and they expect to be thought generous towards their friends if they put them in the way of getting rich no matter by what means such conduct however is so remote from moral duty that nothing can be more completely opposed to duty we must therefore take care to indulge only in such liberality as will help our friends and hurt no one the conveyance of property by lucius sulla and gaius kaiser from its rightful owners to the hands of strangers should for that reason not be regarded as generosity for nothing is generous if it is not at the same time just the second point for the exercise of caution was that our beneficence should not exceed our means for those who wish to be more open-handed than their circumstances permit are guilty of two faults first they do wrong to their next of kin for they transfer to strangers property which would more justly be placed at their service or bequeathed to them and second such generosity too often engenders a passion for plundering and misappropriating property in order to supply the means for making large gifts we may also observe that a great many people do many things that seem to be inspired more by a spirit of ostentation than by heartfelt kindness for such people are not really generous but are rather influenced by a sort of ambition to make a show of being open-handed such a pose is nearer akin to hypocrisy than to generosity or moral goodness the third rule laid down was that in acts of kindness we should weigh with discrimination the worthiness of the object of our benevolence we should take into consideration his moral character his attitude towards us the intimacy of his relations to us and our common social ties as well as the services he has hitherto rendered in our interest it is to be desired that all these considerations should be combined in the same person if they are not then the more numerous and the more important considerations must have the greater weight fifteen now the men we live with are not perfect and ideally wise but men who do very well if there be found in them but the semblance of virtue i therefore think that this is to be taken for granted that no one should be entirely neglected who shows any trace of virtue but the more a man is endowed with these finer virtues temperance self-control and that very justice about which so much has already been said the more he deserves to be favoured i do not mention fortitude for a courageous spirit in a man who has not attained perfection and ideal wisdom is generally too impetuous it is those other virtues that seem more particularly to mark the good man so much in regard to the character of the object of our beneficence but as to the affection which any one may have for us it is the first demand of duty that we do most for him who loves us most but we should measure affection not like youngsters by the ardour of its passion but rather by its strength and constancy but if there shall be obligations already incurred so that kindness is not to begin with us but to be requited still greater diligence it seems is called for 
for no duty is more imperative than that of proving one's gratitude. But if, as Hesiod bids, one is to repay with interest, if possible, what one has borrowed in time of need, what, pray, ought we to do when challenged by an unsought kindness? Shall we not imitate the fruitful fields, which return more than they receive? For if we do not hesitate to confer favours upon those who we hope will be of help to us, how ought we to deal with those who have already helped us? For generosity is of two kinds, doing a kindness and requiting one. Whether we do the kindness or not is optional, but to fail to requite one is not allowable to a good man, provided he can make the requital without violating the rights of others. Furthermore, we must make some discrimination between favours received, for, as a matter of course, the greater the favour, the greater is the obligation. But in deciding this we must, above all, give due weight to the spirit, the devotion, the affection that prompted the favour. For many people often do favours impulsively for everybody, without discrimination, prompted by a morbid sort of benevolence, or by a sudden impulse of the heart, shifting as the wind. Such acts of generosity are not to be so highly esteemed as those which are performed with judgment, deliberation, and mature consideration. But in bestowing a kindness, as well as in making a requital, the first rule of duty requires us, other things being equal, to lend assistance, preferably to people in proportion to their individual need. Most people adopt the contrary course. They put themselves most eagerly at the service of the one from whom they hope to receive the greatest favours, even though he has no need of their help. 16. The interests of society, however, and its common bonds will be best conserved if kindness be shown to each individual in proportion to the closeness of his relationship. But it seems we must trace back to their ultimate sources the principles of fellowship and society that nature has established among men. The first principle is that which is found in the connection subsisting between all the members of the human race. And that bond of connection is reason and speech, which, by the process of teaching and learning, of communicating, discussing, and reasoning, associate men together, and unite them in a sort of natural fraternity. In no other particular are we farther removed from the nature of beasts, for we admit that they may have courage, horses and lions, for example, but we do not admit that they have justice, equity, and goodness, for they are not endowed with reason or speech. This, then, is the most comprehensive bond that unites together men as men, and all to all and under it the common right to all things that nature has produced for the common use of man is to be maintained, with the understanding that while everything assigned as private property by the statutes and by civil law shall be so held as prescribed by those same laws, everything else shall be regarded in the light indicated by the Greek proverb, amongst friends all things in common. Furthermore, we find the common property of all men in things of the sort defined by Ennius, and, though restricted by him to one instance, the principle may be applied very generally. Who kindly sets a wanderer on his way, does in as if he lit another's lamp by his. No less shines his, when he his friends hath lit. In this example, he effectively teaches us all to bestow even upon a stranger what it costs us nothing to give. On this principle we have the following maxims. Deny no one the water that flows by. Let any one who will take fire from our fire. Honest counsel give to one who is in doubt. For such acts are useful to the recipient and cause the giver no loss. We should, therefore, adopt these principles and always be contributing something to the common weal. But since the resources of individuals are limited, and the number of the needy is infinite, this spirit of universal liberality must be regulated according to that test of Ennius. No less shines his. In order that we may continue to have the means for being generous to our friends. 17. Then, too, there are a great many degrees of closeness or remoteness in human society. To proceed beyond the universal bond of our common humanity, there is the closer one of belonging to the same people, tribe, and tongue, 
by which men are very closely bound together it is a still closer relation to be citizens of the same city-state for fellow-citizens have much in common forum temples colonnades streets statutes laws courts rights of suffrage to say nothing of social and friendly circles and diverse business relations with many but a still closer social union exists between kindred starting with that infinite bond of union of the human race in general the conception is now confined to a small and narrow circle for since the reproductive instinct is by nature's gift the common possession of all living creatures the first bond of union is that between husband and wife the next that between parents and children then we find one home with everything in common and this is the foundation of civil government the nursery as it were of the state then follow the bonds between brothers and sisters and next those of first and then of second cousins and when they can no longer be sheltered under one roof they go out into other homes as into colonies then follow between these in turn marriages and connections by marriage and from these again a new stock of relations and from this propagation and aftergrowth states have their beginnings the bonds of common blood hold men fast through good will and affection for it means much to share in common the same family traditions the same forms of domestic worship and the same ancestral tombs but of all the bonds of fellowship there is none more noble none more powerful than when good men of congenial character are joined in intimate friendship for really if we discover in another that moral goodness on which i dwell so much it attracts us and makes us friends to the one in whose character it seems to dwell and while every virtue attracts us and makes us love those who seem to possess it still justice and generosity do so most of all nothing moreover is more conducive to love and intimacy than compatibility of character in good men for when two people have the same ideals and the same tastes it is a natural consequence that each loves the other as himself and the result is as pythagoras requires of ideal friendship that several are united in one another strong bond of fellowship is effected by mutual interchange of kind services and as long as these kindnesses are mutual and acceptable those between whom they are interchanged are united by the ties of an enduring intimacy but when with a rational spirit you have surveyed the whole field there is no social relation among them all more close none more dear than that which links each one of us with our country parents are dear dear are children relatives friends but one native land embraces all our loves and who that is true would hesitate to give his life for her if by his death he could render her a service so much the more execrable are those monsters who have torn their fatherland to pieces with every form of outrage and who are and have been engaged in compassing her utter destruction now if a contrast and comparison were to be made to find out where most of our moral obligation is due country would come first and parents for their services have laid us under the heaviest obligation next come children and the whole family who look to us alone for support and can have no other protection finally our kinsmen with whom we live on good terms and with whom for the most part our lot is one all needful material assistance is therefore due first of all to those whom i have named but intimate relationship of life and living counsel conversation encouragement comfort and sometimes even reproof flourish best in friendships and that friendship is sweetest which is cemented by congeniality of character eighteen but in the performance of all these duties we shall have to consider what is most needful in each individual case and what each individual person can or cannot procure without our help in this way we shall find that the claims of social relationship in its various degrees are not identical with the dictates of circumstances for there are obligations that are due to one individual rather than to another for example one would sooner assist a neighbor in gathering his harvest than either a brother or a friend but should it be a case in court 
one would defend a kinsman and a friend rather than a neighbor such questions as these must therefore be taken into consideration in every act of moral duty and we must acquire the habit and keep it up in order to become good calculators of duty able by adding and subtracting to strike a balance correctly and find out just how much is due to each individual but as neither physicians nor generals nor orators can achieve any signal success without experience and practice no matter how well they may understand the theory of their profession so the rules for the discharge of duty are formulated it is true as i am doing now but a matter of such importance requires experience also and practice this must close our discussion of the ways in which moral goodness on which duty depends is developed from those principles which hold good in human society we must realize however that while we have set down four cardinal virtues from which as sources moral rectitude and moral duty emanate that achievement is most glorious in the eyes of the world which is one with a spirit great exalted and superior to the vicissitudes of earthly life and so when we wish to hurl a taunt the very first to rise to our lips is if possible something like this for ye young men show a womanish soul yon maiden a man's and this thou son of salmachis win spoils that cost nor sweat nor blood when on the other hand we wish to pay a compliment we somehow or other praise in more eloquent strain the brave and noble work of some great soul hence there is an open field for orators on the subjects of marathon salamis plataea thermopylae and leuctra and hence our own cocles the deci gnaeus and publius scipio marcus marcellus and countless others and above all the roman people as a nation are celebrated for greatness of spirit their passion for military glory moreover is shown in the fact that we see their statues usually in soldiers garb nineteen but if the exaltation of spirit seen in times of danger and toil is devoid of justice and fights for selfish ends instead of for the common good it is a vice for not only has it no element of virtue but its nature is barbarous and revolting to all our finer feelings the stoics therefore correctly define courage as that virtue which champions the cause of right accordingly no one has attained to true glory who has gained a reputation for courage by treachery and cunning for nothing that lacks justice can be morally right this then is a fine saying of plato's not only must all knowledge that is divorced from justice be called cunning rather than wisdom he says but even the courage that is prompt to face danger if it is inspired not by public spirit but by its own selfish purposes should have the name of effrontery rather than of courage and so we demand that men who are courageous and high-souled shall at the same time be good and straightforward lovers of truth and foes to deception for these qualities are the centre and soul of justice but the mischief is that from this exaltation and greatness of spirit spring all too readily self-will and excessive lust for power for just as plato tells us that the whole national character of the spartans was on fire with passion for victory so in the same way the more notable a man is for his greatness of spirit the more ambitious he is to be the foremost citizen or i should say rather to be sole ruler but when one begins to aspire to pre-eminence it is difficult to preserve that spirit of fairness which is absolutely essential to justice the result is that such men do not allow themselves to be constrained either by argument or by any public and lawful authority but they only too often prove to be bribers and agitators in public life seeking to obtain supreme power and to be superiors through force rather than equals through justice but the greater the difficulty the greater the glory for no occasion arises that can excuse a man for being guilty of injustice so then not those who do injury but those who prevent it are to be considered brave and courageous moreover true and philosophic greatness of spirit regards the moral goodness to which nature most aspires as consisting in deeds not in fame and prefers to be first in reality rather than in name and we must approve this view 
for he who depends upon the caprice of the ignorant rabble cannot be numbered among the great then too the higher a man's ambition the more easily he is tempted to acts of injustice by his desire for fame we are now to be sure on very slippery ground for scarcely can the man be found who has passed through trials and encountered dangers and does not then wish for glory as a reward for his achievements twenty the soul that is altogether courageous and great is marked above all by two characteristics one of these is indifference to outward circumstances for such a person cherishes the conviction that nothing but moral goodness and propriety deserves to be either admired or wished for or striven after and that he ought not to be subject to any man or any passion or any accident of fortune the second characteristic is that when the soul is disciplined in the way above mentioned one should do deeds not only great and in the highest degree useful but extremely arduous and laborious and fraught with danger both to life and to many things that make life worth living all the glory and greatness and i may add all the usefulness of these two characteristics of courage are centred in the latter the rational cause that makes men great in the former for it is the former that contains the element that makes souls pre-eminent and indifferent to worldly fortune and this quality is distinguished by two criteria one if one account moral rectitude as the only good and two if one be free from all passion for we must agree that it takes a brave and heroic soul to hold as slight what most people think grand and glorious and to disregard it from fixed and settled principles and it requires strength of character and great singleness of purpose to bear what seems painful as it comes to pass in many and various forms in human life and to bear it so unflinchingly as not to be shaken in the least from one's natural state of the dignity of a philosopher moreover it would be inconsistent for the man who is not overcome by fear to be overcome by desire or for the man who has shown himself invincible to toil to be conquered by pleasure we must therefore not only avoid the latter but also beware of ambition for wealth for there is nothing so characteristic of narrowness and littleness of soul as the love of riches and there is nothing more honourable and noble than to be indifferent to money if one does not possess it and to devote it to beneficence and liberality if one does possess it as i said before we must also beware of ambition for glory for it robs us of liberty and in defence of liberty a high-souled man should stake everything and one ought not to seek military authority nay rather it ought sometimes to be declined sometimes to be resigned again we must keep ourselves free from every disturbing emotion not only from desire and fear but also from excessive pain and pleasure and from anger so that we may enjoy that calm of soul and freedom from care which bring both moral stability and dignity of character but there have been many and still are many who while pursuing that calm of soul of which i speak have withdrawn from civic duty and taken refuge in retirement among such have been found the most famous and by far the foremost philosophers and certain other earnest thoughtful men who could not endure the conduct of either the people or their leaders some of them too lived in the country and found their pleasure in the management of their private estates such men have had the same aims as kings to suffer no want to be subject to no authority to enjoy their liberty that is in its essence to live just as they please twenty one so while this desire is common to men of political ambitions and men of retirement of whom i have just spoken the one class think they can attain their end if they secure large means the other if they are content with the little they have and in this matter neither way of thinking is altogether to be condemned but the life of retirement is easier and safer and at the same time less burdensome or troublesome to others while the career of those who apply themselves to statecraft and to conducting great enterprises is more profitable to mankind and contributes more to their own greatness and renown so perhaps those men of extraordinary genius who have devoted themselves to learning must be excused for not taking part in public affairs likewise those who from ill health 
or from some still more valid reason have retired from the service of the state and left to others the opportunity and the glory of its administration but if those who have no such excuse profess a scorn for civil and military offices which most people admire i think that this should be set down not to their credit but to their discredit for in so far as they care little as they say for glory and count it as naught it is difficult not to sympathize with their attitude in reality however they seem to dread the toil and trouble and also perhaps the discredit and humiliation of political failure and defeat for there are people who in opposite circumstances do not act consistently they have the utmost contempt for pleasure but in pain they are too sensitive they are indifferent to glory but they are crushed by disgrace and even in their inconsistency they show no great consistency but those whom nature has endowed with the capacity for administering public affairs should put aside all hesitation enter the race for public office and take a hand in directing the government for in no other way can a government be administered or greatness of spirit be made manifest statesmen too no less than philosophers perhaps even more so should carry with them that greatness of spirit and indifference to outward circumstances to which i so often refer together with calm of soul and freedom from care if they are to be free from worries and lead a dignified and self-consistent life this is easier for the philosophers as their life is less exposed to the assaults of fortune their wants are fewer and if any misfortune overtakes them their fall is not so disastrous not without reason therefore are stronger emotions aroused in those who engage in public life than in those who live in retirement and greater is their ambition for success the more therefore do they need to enjoy greatness of spirit and freedom from annoying cares if any one is entering public life let him beware of thinking only of the honour that it brings but let him be sure also that he has the ability to succeed at the same time let him take care not to lose heart too readily through discouragement nor yet to be overconfident through ambition in a word before undertaking any enterprise careful preparation must be made twenty two most people think that the achievements of war are more important than those of peace but this opinion needs to be corrected for many men have sought occasions for war from the mere ambition for fame this is notably the case with men of great spirit and natural ability and it is the more likely to happen if they are adapted to a soldier's life and fond of warfare but if we will face the facts we shall find that there have been many instances of achievement in peace more important and no less renowned than in war however highly themistocles for example may be extolled and deservedly and however much more illustrious his name may be than solon's and however much salamis may be cited as witness of his most glorious victory a victory glorified above solon's statesmanship in instituting the areopagus yet solon's achievement is not to be accounted less illustrious than his for themistocles's victory served the state once and only once while solon's work will be of service for ever for through his legislation the laws of the athenians and the institutions of their fathers are maintained and while themistocles could not readily point to any instance in which he himself had rendered assistance to the areopagus the areopagus might with justice assert that themistocles had received assistance from it for the war was directed by the councils of that senate which solon had created the same may be said of pausanias and lysander although it is thought that it was by their achievements that sparta gained her supremacy yet these are not even remotely to be compared with the legislation and discipline of lycurgus nay rather it was due to these that pausanias and lysander had armies so brave and so well disciplined for my own part i do not consider that marcus scaurus was inferior to gaius marius when i was a lad or quintus catalus to gnaeus pompey when i was engaged in public life for arms are of little value in the field unless there is wise counsel at home so too africanus though a great man and a soldier of extraordinary ability did no greater service to the state by destroying numantia 
then was done at the same time by publius nasica though not then clothed with official authority by removing tiberius gracchus this deed does not to be sure belong wholly to the domain of civil affairs it partakes of the nature of war also since it was affected by violence but it was for all that executed as a political measure without the help of an army the whole truth however is in this verse against which i am told the malicious and envious are wont to rail yield ye arms to the toga to civic praises ye laurels not to mention other instances did not arms yield to the toga when i was at the helm of state for never was the republic in more serious peril never was peace more profound thus as the result of my counsels and my vigilance their weapons slipped suddenly from the hands of the most desperate traitors dropped to the ground of their own accord what achievement in war then was ever so great what triumph can be compared with that for i may boast to you my son marcus for to you belong the inheritance of that glory of mine and the duty of imitating my deeds and it was to me too that gnaeus pompey a hero crowned with the honours of war paid this tribute in the hearing of many when he said that his third triumph would have been gained in vain if he were not to have through my services to the state a place in which to celebrate it there are therefore instances of civic courage that are not inferior to the courage of the soldier nay the former calls for even greater energy and greater devotion than the latter twenty three that moral goodness which we look for in a lofty high-minded spirit is secured of course by moral not by physical strength and yet the body must be trained and so disciplined that it can obey the dictates of judgment and reason in attending to business and in enduring toil but that moral goodness which is our theme depends wholly upon the thought and attention given to it by the mind and in this way the men who in a civil capacity direct the affairs of the nation render no less important service than they who conduct its wars by their statesmanship oftentimes wars are either averted or terminated sometimes also they are declared upon marcus cato's council for example the third punic war was undertaken and in its conduct his influence was dominant even after he was dead and so diplomacy in the friendly settlement of controversies is more desirable than courage in settling them on the battlefield but we must be careful not to take that course merely for the sake of avoiding war rather than for the sake of public expediency war however should be undertaken in such a way as to make it evident that it has no other object than to secure peace but it takes a brave and resolute spirit not to be disconcerted in times of difficulty or ruffled and thrown off one's feet as the saying is but to keep one's presence of mind and one's self-possession and not to swerve from the path of reason now all this requires great personal courage but it calls also for great intellectual ability by reflection to anticipate the future to discover some time in advance what may happen whether for good or for ill and what must be done in any possible event and never to be reduced to having to say i had not thought of that these are the activities that mark a spirit strong high and self-reliant in its prudence and wisdom but to mix rashly in the fray and to fight hand to hand with the enemy is but a barbarous and brutish kind of business yet when the stress of circumstances demands it we must gird on the sword and prefer death to slavery and disgrace twenty four as to destroying and plundering cities let me say that great care should be taken that nothing be done in reckless cruelty or wantonness and it is a great man's duty in troublous times to single out the guilty for punishment to spare the many and in every turn of fortune to hold to a true and honourable course for whereas there are many as i have said before who place the achievements of war above those of peace so one may find many to whom adventurous hot-headed counsels seem more brilliant and more impressive than calm and well-considered measures we must of course never be guilty of seeming cowardly and craven in our avoidance of danger 
but we must also beware of exposing ourselves to danger needlessly nothing can be more foolhardy than that accordingly in encountering danger we should do as doctors do in their practice in like cases of illness they give mild treatment in cases of dangerous sickness they are compelled to apply hazardous and even desperate remedies it is therefore only a madman who in a calm would pray for a storm a wise man's way is when the storm does come to withstand it with all the means at his command and especially when the advantages to be expected in case of a successful issue are greater than the hazards of the struggle the dangers attending great affairs of state fall sometimes upon those who undertake them sometimes upon the state in carrying out such enterprises some run the risk of losing their lives others their reputation and the good will of their fellow-citizens it is our duty then to be more ready to endanger our own than the public welfare and to hazard honour and glory more readily than other advantages many on the other hand have been found who were ready to pour out not only their money but their lives for their country and yet would not consent to make even the slightest sacrifice of personal glory even though the interests of their country demanded it for example when Callicratidas, as spartan admiral in the peloponnesian war had won many signal successes he spoiled everything at the end by refusing to listen to the proposal of those who thought he ought to withdraw his fleet from the Arginusai and not to risk an engagement with the Athenians. His answer to them was that the Spartans could build another fleet if they lost that one, but he could not retreat without dishonor to himself. And yet what he did dealt only a slight blow to Sparta. There was another which proved disastrous when Cleombrotus, in fear of criticism recklessly went into battle against epaminondas in consequence of that the spartan power fell how much better was the conduct of quintus maximus of him ennius says one man and he alone restored our state by delaying not in the least did fame with him take precedence of safety therefore now does his glory shine bright and it grows ever brighter. This sort of offence must be avoided no less in political life, for there are men who for fear of giving offence do not dare to express their honest opinion, no matter how excellent. 25. Those who propose to take charge of the affairs of government should not fail to remember two of Plato's rules. First, to keep the good of the people so clearly in view that regardless of their own interests they will make their every action conform to that second to care for the welfare of the whole body politic and not in serving the interests of some one party to betray the rest for the administration of the government like the office of a trustee must be conducted for the benefit of those entrusted to one's care not of those to whom it is entrusted now those who care for the interests of a part of the citizens and neglect another part introduce into the civil service a dangerous element dissension and party strife the result is that some are found to be loyal supporters of the democratic others of the aristocratic party and few of the nation as a whole as a result of this party spirit bitter strife arose at athens and in our own country not only dissensions but also disastrous civil wars broke out all this the citizen who is patriotic brave and worthy of a leading place in the state will shun with abhorrence he will dedicate himself unreservedly to his country without aiming at influence or power for himself and he will devote himself to the state in its entirety in such a way as to further the interests of all besides he will not expose any one to hatred or disrepute by groundless charges but he will surely cleave to justice and honour so closely that he will submit to any loss however heavy rather than be untrue to them and will face death itself rather than renounce them a most wretched custom assuredly is our electioneering and scrambling for office concerning this also we find a fine thought in plato those who compete against one another he says to see which of two candidates shall administer the government are like sailors quarrelling as to which one of them shall do the steering 
and he likewise lays down the rule that we should regard only those as adversaries who take up arms against the state not those who strive to have the government administered according to their convictions this was the spirit of the disagreement between publius africanus and quintus metellus there was in it no trace of rancor neither must we listen to those who think that one should indulge in violent anger against one's political enemies and imagine that such is the attitude of a great spirited brave man for nothing is more commendable nothing more becoming in a pre-eminently great man than courtesy and forbearance indeed in a free people where all enjoy equal rights before the law we must school ourselves to affability and what is called mental poise for if we are irritated when people intrude upon us at unseasonable hours or make unreasonable requests we shall develop a sour churlish temper prejudicial to ourselves and offensive to others and yet gentleness of spirit and forbearance are to be commended only with the understanding that strictness may be exercised for the good of the state for without that the government cannot be well administered on the other hand if punishment or correction must be administered it need not be insulting it ought to have regard to the welfare of the state not to the personal satisfaction of the man who administers the punishment or reproof we should take care also that the punishment shall not be out of proportion to the offence and that some shall not be chastised for the same fault for which others are not even called to account in administering punishment it is above all necessary to allow no trace of anger for if any one proceeds in a passion to inflict punishment he will never observe that happy mean which lies between excess and defect this doctrine of the mean is approved by the peripatetics and wisely approved if only they did not speak in praise of anger and tell us that it is a gift bestowed on us by nature for a good purpose but in reality anger is in every circumstance to be eradicated and it is to be desired that they who administer the government should be like the laws which are led to inflict punishment not by wrath but by justice twenty six again when fortune smiles and the stream of life flows according to our wishes let us diligently avoid all arrogance haughtiness and pride for it is as much a sign of weakness to give way to one's feelings in success as it is in adversity but it is a fine thing to keep an unruffled temper an unchanging mien and the same cast of countenance in every condition of life this history tells us was characteristic of socrates and no less of gaius lilius philip king of macedon i observe whoever surpassed by his son in achievements and fame was superior to him in affability and refinement philip accordingly was always great alexander often infamously bad there seems to be sound advice therefore in this word of warning the higher we are placed the more humbly should we walk Panetius tells us that Africanus, his pupil and friend, used to say, As, when horses have become meddlesome and unmanageable on account of their frequent participation in battles, their owners put them in the hands of trainers to make them more tractable, so men, who through prosperity have become restive and over-self-confident, ought to be put into the training ring, so to speak, of reason and learning, that they may be brought to comprehend the frailty of human affairs and the fickleness of fortune the greater our prosperity moreover the more should we seek the counsel of friends and the greater the heed that should be given to their advice under such circumstances also we must beware of lending an ear to sycophants or allowing them to impose upon us with their flattery for it is easy in this way to deceive ourselves since we thus come to think ourselves duly entitled to praise and to this frame of mind a thousand delusions may be traced when men are puffed up with conceit and expose themselves to ignominy and ridicule by committing the most egregious blunders so much for this subject to revert to the original question we must decide that the most important activities those most indicative of a great spirit are performed by the men who direct the affairs of nations for such public activities have the widest scope and touch the lives of the most people
but even in the life of retirement there are and there have been many high-souled men who have been engaged in important inquiries or embarked on most important enterprises and yet kept themselves within the limits of their own affairs or taking a middle course between philosophers on the one hand and statesmen on the other they were content with managing their own property not increasing it by any and every means nor debarring their kindred from the enjoyment of it but rather if ever there were need sharing it with their friends and with the state only let it in the first place be honestly acquired by the use of no dishonest or fraudulent means let it in the second place increase by wisdom industry and thrift and finally let it be made available for the use of as many as possible if only they are worthy and be at the service of generosity and beneficence rather than of sensuality and excess by observing these rules one may live in magnificence dignity and independence and yet in honour truth and charity toward all end of section twenty six of book one recording in memory of mitchell edwards